Good morning to you all and welcome to today's webinar for the Opioid Technology Challenge, Topic 3, Connect, brought to you by Nine Sigma. My name is Jonathan Yakshaw from Nine Sigma and I will be your host and moderator today. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. The recording and, trans and transcription will be made available on the Opioid Technology Challenge page. Let's review our agenda for today. After I introduce our speakers, uh, representatives from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and Nine Sigma will discuss the project in greater depth. We'll conclude by addressing your questions during a live Q&A session, followed by a brief summary of project information, including how to request additional information or assistance. As we proceed through today's presentation, please feel free to ask your questions at any time. We'll keep track of your questions and respond to them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Should you need any additional information or assistance outside of today's webinar, please feel free to contact the Nine Sigma Provider Help Desk at phd at ninesigma.com. At this time, I would like to introduce our panelists for today's webinar. First, we're joined by David Gustafson, PhD, Director of the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Kevin Andrews, PhD, Senior Program Manager from Nine Sigma. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today. We'll begin with Kevin Andrews from Nine Sigma. Kevin, could you please give our attendees an overview of this challenge topic? Yeah, let's start with um, what, what the challenge is about. It's a three-phase prize-based competition to find technology-based solutions that address the opioid crisis through either addiction prevention and treatment or overdose avoidance or response. And to that end, uh, this three-phase challenge, uh, we, we've completed phase one, the idea phase. That, that occurred uh, uh, late in 2017. We're now in phase two, the challenge phase, and that phase has prizes, uh, 12 prizes, up to 12 prizes of $200,000. The challenge phase winners will then be able to compete in phase three, which is the product phase, and there will be submissions due in July 2019, and then uh, those challenge phase winners uh, who submit will be uh, uh, able to compete for up to four $1 million prizes. And so um, the, the challenge phase consists of four topics, diagnose, prevent, connect, and protect. And today's webinar is focused on topic three, connect, provide immediate and extended access for relapse or overdose interventions. In the very back seat of the number 12 bus, only Jeremy's eyes were moving as he scanned the shadows outside, his forehead pressed up against the glass. He had missed his stop. It was 1.30 in the morning, and when the bus had approached his street, he had imagined lifting his arm up to pull the cord. He had imagined himself walking up the stairs to his crappy little apartment. He had imagined himself flop into his grubby, sunken couch and pull his tiny TV close enough to watch. But he hadn't pulled the cord. He was motionless, with a tiny spark of excitement and a tiny spark of nausea circling like flies in his stomach. The park ten minutes ahead, on the number 12 line, is where he used to score. He could feel it getting closer, though he couldn't see it. He had no intention of getting off the bus at the park. He just wanted to drift by and catch a glimpse. He was shaken out of his trance when his cell phone went off. Well, um, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to spend a little bit of uh, time with, with you folks. Uh, we're, um, we're talking about a really serious issue here. Um, um, just recently, on, in October of last year, a good friend of mine uh, died of an opioid overdose. His father was a graduate student of mine, outstanding graduate student, but also a, a, a wonderful family man. He and his wife uh, were very, are very close, and uh, 
and their kids are people who, um, you know, grew up a, with a with a lot of love and a lot of attention uh, and a lot of caring. Uh, but uh, about at about age twelve or thirteen, Tim, I'll call him Tim, um, uh, began to experiment with. Uh, some things and uh, it eventually moved up into opioids. Tim fought uh, that opioid addiction for more than half of his life. Um, he um, was uh, a person who was extremely caring. He would do almost anything for anybody. And the last four and a half years of his life, he had been clean. Uh, he had gotten back into college, was uh, in his final semester of getting a degree in brain science and going on for his master's degree. Uh, he lived in an apartment in uh, the town where his uh, university education was taking place. And uh, one night he got a call from a, a neighbor down the hall. And she basically said, my husband is coming out of rehab. I'm worried that he's got a stash of drugs in the apartment here. I can't find them, but I just, uh, I'm pretty sure there's something here. Would you come down and help me find it and clean it out? Tim went down and, and he, uh, to help his friend, and um, he found part of the stash, um, removed it from the house, or the apartment, went down to his apartment, closed the door, and succumbed um, literally and figuratively. Two hours later, he was dead. The friend came home and uh, within two hours after that, found a stash that was missed, took an overdose and died. Um, if you had asked me to predict somebody who would uh, have died of an opioid overdose, uh, I never, ever would have picked this family. And I never would have predicted Tim would do it. He was such a wonderful, kind, bright human being. Next slide, please. Tim's not the only one, obviously. Drug overdoses are killing about 64,000 Americans every year. 40,000 of those op overdoses are due to, to opioids. And so, you know, if you're going to be applying for this uh, particular project, certainly it's an opportunity, an opportunity to have finance, financing to do something important. I just hope that as you, you approach this, you take it, the, this project as a calling and, and really set, set the priority around the issue that none of us is immune from this particular problem. And you have an opportunity here to make an incredible difference in the lives of so many people in Ohio, but also across the country and conceivably across the world. And I just hope you'll set the, the, that opportunity is the number one, um, I'm sorry, that calling is the number one reason for you to get into this. Next slide, please. Um, when I was asked to, to get into uh, the addiction treatment field, um, I was an engineer who was working in uh, the, the, what I'll call the traditional health system. And I had never, fortunately, had never dealt with ad addiction, nor had anybody in my family that I know of ever dealt with addiction. And so when I was asked to take over an addiction uh, program for, and run a national program office for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I figured I just I needed to be able to better understand this disease because I didn't know anything about it, and so I got admitted for heroin addiction, twice, two different uh, addiction treatment agencies, once in one in New York City and one here. So um, as I as I had said, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation contacted me and asked me to head up a national program office on addiction. And I didn't know anything about the topic. And uh, so I got myself admitted for heroin addiction. I still don't know what the stuff is, it looks like. And so, um, but I 
created a persona. Everybody in the two treatment agencies where I did this knew that I was fake, but I asked them to treat me in exactly the way in which a heroin addict would be treated. So I've, I spent hours being interviewed by a social worker. I spent hours filling out forms and doing, uh, a answering incredibly embarrassing questions. At the end of the process, uh, they said, well, you know, you need to be admitted, but uh, unfortunately we don't have a bed for you. Um, so call us back once a week to let us know if you're still interested. And so I did. I first week I called back, and what I got was an answering machine that said simply, "Leave a message." So I was told to call back. When I did call back uh, to say that I was still interested in an admission, it uh, I I was greeted by an answering machine that said one thing: "Leave a message." Didn't say the name of the organization didn't say anything other than leave a message. I left a message in week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, week six, and week seven. After seven weeks of calling back, they finally said, well, we've finally got a bed for you. And, um, and, and I guess, I'm not sure, but if I was a heroin addict, after seven weeks, I would not be clean. I'm sure I would have relapsed on many occasions. Um, I th so this is one of the problems. We have a system that's built uh, that is incredibly inefficient and incredibly, uh, I think, ineffective. And the problem is that when I am, you know, if I, if I get all sorts of uh, needs, uh, cravings, uh, you know, I need help immediately. I don't need help a week from now or seven weeks from now. The third uh, thing, and the, another reason why we want to get into this area, you and I, we all want to get into this area, is because right now, 70% of the cost of addiction treatment is in labor. And the labor, frankly, is composed of humans. And human, there are some humans that are absolutely outstanding, some that are mediocre, and some that are, frankly, really bad. And so we we have an issue where fidelity to even the best of the treatment processes is highly limited. And it's my opinion that we've got to automate the addiction treatment field to, to get something that's consistent, reliable, and timely, and effective, and efficient. Next slide, please. This is a slide that I, I wanted to go over with you because um, uh, it, it sort of describes, in a sense, uh, the best thinking in this field. This was developed by a guy by the name of Marlott, and then uh, Katie Wickiewicz also uh, has contributed a lot to these plans. But, uh, but in, in, in any case, um, the, the bolded uh, squares that you see, or rectangles that you see, are various stages that people go through in um, their addiction uh, treatment life and their addiction life. And then the things that are sort of grayed out on the top are best guesses about the way to fix uh, the problem at these various stages. Of course, given the inefficiency and ineffectiveness of the field, it's very possible that these are not even close to what's, what's needed. But it'll, at least it'll give you a rough idea of, of a lot of the thinking in the field these days. So let's look at the bottom for a second. Uh, a person who, let's take a person who is c currently clean and trying to avoid relapse uh, into heroin use. Uh, they're going along and, and doing pretty fine. And then something goes out of whack. You, you know, who knows what it is that might cause an imbalance in their life. But as a result of that imbalance, they may start thinking, um, you know, I need, I need something new. I need something to help me get over this hump I'm in. And, and then if you go to the right one step further, uh, what you see is that they begin to have urges and cravings to uh, use again. 
And then they might encounter, or might not, uh, a high-risk situation. If they do high, have a high-risk situation, then sometimes they're just not prepared for it. They don't have a coping response to deal with the problem. And as a result of that, their self-confidence, their self-efficacy, if you will, um, their, ability, their belief that they can avoid heroin begins to deteriorate. And they may then get into an initial substance abuse situation. It, it may just be a brief one-time thing, but it could easily lead to a relapse. And, um, and then uh, they get into this situation of, oh, I'm no good, I've failed completely. And um, because they violated <coughs> their commitment to abstinence, um, they say, what the hell, and then they go off and start using again. So that's sort of the bottom thing, okay? And the stuff on the top says, well, what do we do about each one of these phases? By the way, again, this is not really linear at all. It implies, for instance, that urges always are confronted with a high-risk situation. That isn't necessarily true. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe a, a situation would go in this order, but maybe not. So if we if we look at lifestyle imbalance, what, what do people... Uh, in this field feel needs to be done in order to do to deal with that. Well, one is obviously to return turn balance to the situation by maybe developing some positive addictions. Uh, jogging and, and uh, meditation are two that are pretty common. And uh, <coughs> also substituting uh, some other indulgences that are that are um, positive ones rather than negative ones. And so getting into sports or who knows what, uh, you know, is to get their mind off the situation uh, and reduce their desire for, to do something bad. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, next phase, stimulus control techniques, you know, if somebody is beginning to have urges and cravings, then um, you one of the ways when you deal with this is, is for instance, to get rid of all the stuff in the apartment so that, yeah, I may be really urging, I may have urges to do something, but I don't have immediate access to it. And that immediacy can really be important because it may very well be that the, uh, that, uh, the craving will be a temporary thing and it'll go away. And, um, and also it's important because medication-assisted treatment is a big part of treating opioid addiction these days. Uh, re finding ways to reduce the barriers to adhering to your medication. And then if you find, you still find that you're in a, uh, in having urges and, and cravings and are in a high-risk situation, then it's going to be really important to do things like self-monitoring and behavior assessment. So for instance, you're going to come up with avoidance strategies to say, if I get myself in this kind of a situation, how am I going to get? How am I going to get it? Get out of it? Thinking ahead about these kind of things. And then, if you find yourself lacking um, a, a coping response, okay, that you're in a high risk situation, you don't know how to handle it, you don't have a coping uh, capability, then uh, coping skills training becomes really important. Now, you want to be able to do that ahead of time because you, if you're right in the midst of a situation, you're not going to be prepared to go into uh, all sorts of CBT training, for instance. Uh, so training ahead of time is going to be important. Um, and and then, it, you know, if that doesn't work and the person's uh, self-confidence goes through the floor and, and they don't think they can stop, then, you know, there have to be various kinds of efficacy enhancement strategies to pull them back from the edge. And there, the field has... Uh, some things uh, 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 like that, for instance, uh, you in cognitive behavior therapy, you look around for uh, alternative ways of looking at a bad situation to interpret it in a positive uh, in a positive way. Um, and then, uh, if that doesn't work, and uh, and the person lapses, then there also needs to be lapse management things, ways of coping with that mistake. Uh, and uh, those are uh, have been built into various kinds of addiction tra treatment programming and that kind of stuff. And then finally, instead of being a failure, you need to have them sort of th 
look at their life and their situation in a different way. And again, some of the CBT stuff can can help there. And so I, I, I don't know if you, you find this useful, but I just wanted to give you a sense of from the field's perspective these days, how do they go about approaching it? What are some of the key elements and 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 uh, and that kind of stuff? And so there you have it. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I guess maybe my last uh, slide for you guys is to is to talk a little bit about what we know about innovative uh, development of innovative solutions to really any kind of problems. Um, this this field of innovation re research is uh, one of the very oldest in the world. I think uh, uh, the writing on it began back in uh, in Roman days, and 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 there's been enormous amounts of work that have been done. A few of them have been really outstanding pieces of research. Uh, Bob Cooper um, did some work at McGill University where he studied innovative organizations uh, in, um, in 13 different industries for about 10 years to try to understand what differentiated successful organizations from unsuccessful organizations in terms of their ability to produce new ideas and um, that kind of stuff. He looked at 80 different factors that were considered potentially you know, important in predicting whether um, whether an innovation will be successful. Out of those 80, um, there were seven that uh, that came out. Um, one of them had more predictive power than all of the other factors that uh, that uh, Cooper looked at and Modesto Medic at Stanford and several other researchers. And, and it's one that that I think we too often underattend. That's to deeply, really deeply, intensively understand your customer and understand and, to, and have a commitment to serving the customer needs. You know, those of us in engineering, we're into problem solving, but I'm not sure that we do a good job of really deeply understanding our customers, not only their needs, but the assets, the things that they bring to the table. And and so, you know, for instance, when I got myself admitted for heroin addiction, I did it because I wanted to feel as much as I could possibly feel, feel what it was like to be somebody in that situation without taking the drug itself. Um, there are other, the other six factors that stood out in the research, but again, I'm close to uh, the importance of understanding your customer were um, making sure that the person who leads the team is widely respected. Um, I won't say any more about that. It, the, the, the leader must be somebody that everybody has faith and belief in. Uh, the next one is sort of interesting because it's uh, in some senses counterintuitive. The really innovative organizations reach outside the field for uh, ideas for improvement. Uh, for instance, when we were trying to um, uh, work on, well, we still are, trying to work on addiction treatment, one of the problems that we had was that patients wouldn't come back for treatment. And, uh, and so we uh, contacted a variety of organizations. One was ABC, the, the uh, uh, you know, TV uh, company. And we talked to the vice president for uh, something there. And we said, you know, you guys are really good at having people return for, uh, uh, for to, to your series, to your programs. Uh, how do you do it? What makes you so much better than anybody else? And the guy said something that was really powerful. He said, he said, we don't try to get people to commit to uh, returning to a series. All we're interested in is getting them to come back the next time. That's all we care about, coming back the next time. And you know that was a really mind-blowing kind of thing in the sense of restructuring our thinking. So going outside the field, finding other organizations that are doing, that are tackling a similar related kind of problem can really be um, critically important. The next one is back to probably uh, sort of obvious, and that is that you, you know, you, you've got to, 
uh, you you need to serve the funder as well as the as well as the customer. The customer, in my mind, is only two people: the patient and the family. That, as far as I'm concerned, there are no other customers. But the funder is in is is in, is important. You got to meet the needs of that person. The, th the next one is a little counterintuitive too, but it's the, the point is that they found in this research that you don't spend a lot of time collecting data. You're gonna, if, you, if you spend too much time collecting data, you ain't gonna have any time to innovate. So, so measure one or two kind of key things, but that's it. The next one is rapid cycle testing. They found that, uh, that the key element here was to not get into these big studies to uh, to definitively determine the effectiveness of something. D try something out, find out what doesn't work, try it out again, uh, find out what still doesn't work, f improve it again, try it out, and do it all within a week or two weeks. So rapid cycle testing was, was uh, really important. And then the final thing is that I hope you guys, as you develop these technologies, worry about how it's gonna be injected into workflow. Um, one of the things that we have found is that if staff have to do much more than lifting a finger, they're not gonna adopt a new technology. So you've really gotta worry about what, what the workflow looks like right now and if you're going to ask the staff to do anything new, you got to expect that nothing is going to work, that they aren't going to do it, and you've got to minimize that and work very hard to figure out how to in, how to inject it in in, in into into uh, workflow. Um, I'll just one very quick example: we we, we develop systems uh, in addition to addiction. We develop systems to help older adults uh, cope with multiple chronic conditions. We collect a lot of data in, in the technology to, that helps clinicians. That data could very easily be transmitted electronically, but uh, to to the doctor. But the doctor doesn't do use that. He uses a fax. He uses a fax, and so we create a fax that can be viewed within five seconds to determine the key elements, and then um, then that fax is given to the doctor when he is, uh, works with his other faxes in the morning, it fits into the workflow. It's easily accepted. No additional work on the part of the patient. You got to make sure that happens. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, thank you for all of that uh, wonderful information, David. Uh, to our attendees, thank you for bearing with us during our uh, technical hiccups earlier in the presentation. Uh, for our attendees listening today, if you have any questions, uh, at any point, please submit them via the, the, the questions box, the chat box. Uh, we'll take your questions and we'll address them during our live Q&A portion coming up in just a little bit. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Kevin Andrews from Nine Sigma, who will tell us a bit more about this challenge, uh, what should the, you should include in your, in your response, and how our responses will be evaluated. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, so um, for all of the challenge topics that we, we have uh, published, um, the next bit of content is similar. Um, there are minimum requirements for your submission. Your submission has to use technology as a component of the approach. That technology could be sensors, diagnostics, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, uh, and or health information technology. You can use software, but only if it's in conjunction with one of those technologies above. You should all already be working on your approach, and you need to have some proof of concept, some compelling data that supports the effectiveness of your approach. We're not just looking for concept ideas at this point. Okay. Um, you must have a clear plan and path forward to get your technology ready for broad deployment or implementation, whether that's to turn it into something commercialized that is sold uh, to providers or users, or whether it's just uh, um, enabled to, you know, to, to be widespread, uh, in, in widespread use. Your approach needs to be able to be implemented 
in the United States. If you're an, if you're an international competitor, um, you need to, to look at what it would take to get it uh, applied here in, in the United States. Uh, your approach should, should be likely to receive regulatory approval. Um, at future point, if you're selected as a challenge phase winner and uh, you participate in the product phase, you need to be able to demonstrate your approach in conjunction with an Ohio-based entity. Next slide. So we want to be clear that there are some approaches that will not qualify for the challenge phase competition. Those approaches that are strictly at an early concept stage of development will not um, score very highly. You have to be working on it. It has to be beyond just an idea in your head. Um, any solution that's going to require current, a change in the current law, policy, or regulation is not eligible. So things that are considered to be illegal right now are not going to, to be considered. Clinical treatment protocols that are not associated with a new technology development. We're not just talking about new clinical treatment protocols. You have to incorporate technology as part of your approach. Alternative pain management therapies, strictly speaking, we're not looking for those. Predictive analytics that inform public policy, not looking for that either. Programs for the direct delivery of social or clinical point of care services that do not have a significant technology component are not uh, eligible. Education and public awareness programs are also not eligible. And professional training programs are not eligible. If, if there's some element of training people how to use the technology, that's of course permissible. But strictly speaking, we're not just looking for training programs. Okay, and the next slide, uh, this is a, a compilation of the general evaluation criteria being applied to all of the topics in the challenge phase. How does your approach align with the key attributes for the topic? With, with each topic, there are specific key attributes that you need to uh, accommodate. What's the technology maturity and time to market? For similar approaches, preference is going to be given to that one which has, that is more mature or that has a shorter time to market. What's the potential for broad deployment or implementation? What's the size or scope of the audience impacted, the so-called market size? How robust is your approach and how effective is your approach? Those are all criteria against which the evaluation team, the third party uh, uh, judging team, will consider as they review your approach, your submission. Next slide. So for topic three, what are the key attributes? Your approach for topic three should do the following. It should enable rapid access to interventions, such as, but not necessarily limited to, connection to trained counselors, connection to a locally available treatment provider, connection to medical intervention that gets administered remotely. Your approach doesn't necessarily have to offer all of those. It, it needs to offer at least one of them. Um, to, your approach should enable the extended access to interventions from remote locations. So if you're in a rural location that doesn't have immediately available care, or if you're in a location that's not close to a hospital, or if you're traveling some, you know, in route somewhere, uh, traveling by bus, train, or boat, and you need help, um, your approach should, should be available in those situations. And finally, your approach should promote positive habit forming or reinforcement. So what kinds of approaches are possible? Um, these, are, these are approaches that um, we've thought of, but aren't necessarily, we're not necessarily limiting to communication technologies, telemedicine, or automated systems that could deliver overdose antidote. If you think about um, immediate intervention, you know, if you had some wearable that triggered um, an antidote, that would certainly be an intervention to avoid overdose. 
All right, the next slide is a summary of all of the elements required in your submission. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these. You can find this list in the challenge summary, which is um, on the page on the website, and, and uh, you can read this at your leisure. But basically, we're actually asking you to provide a structured response. And we're asking you to be sufficiently concise that your overall submission is um, on the order of 18 pages maximum. You are also able to link, uh, provide a link to a video if you'd like to, to describe and sort of pitch your, your proposed approach, and you'll be able to upload supporting documents. Next slide. So this is a visual summary of the timeline. The challenge phase launched in February. We are here today uh, at the webinar, and the deadline for our submission is July 11th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We will announce uh, winners, prize recipients in September, and the product phase will begin uh, September of 2018 and continue through July of 2019. And then post-challenge for those who win the product phase awards is from 2019 to 2021. Great. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you again to David. Uh, we'll now turn to our frequently asked questions. These are questions that have either already been asked via the Nine Sigma Provider Help Desk or are common questions to other Nine Sigma projects. First off, Kevin, can you please explain what you mean when you say that an entrant must be registered to do business and be in good standing in the state of Ohio? Sure. So in the rules uh, for the challenge, this this language exists um, regarding that registration to do business in Ohio there is a website page on the state of Ohio website uh, we'll provide that link in the transcript from this session um, it takes you to the forms that you would have to fill out there are forms for a non-Ohio uh, entity either as a for-profit organization or a non-profit organization the for-profit form is 530A, the nonprofit form is 530B, and there is a registration fee that's payable to the state of Ohio, um, $99 US. Okay. And the second question builds off of that first one uh, and is related to when that registration needs to take place, uh, before submitting response or, after, or, excuse me, before accepting an award. Yeah, so you do not need to register to do business in the state of Ohio in order to submit your challenge response. If your submission is selected as a winner, you would then need to register to do business in Ohio before accepting the award. Okay. This, this paperwork, by the way, basically facilitates um, the state knowing how to, you know, how to pay you, what, what kinds of information regarding, you know, your um, address and tax ID number and things like that. Okay. Uh, who is eligible to compete for the project phase? So, Excuse me, product phase. Thank you. So in the product phase, only the winners of the challenge phase are eligible. So there are up to 12 pro uh, challenge phase winners. Those who compete for the four $1 million prizes, there will only, only be no more than 12 okay. parties. Our next question, do I have to fill in each section of the online response form or can I prepare my submission as an attached document? You can do either. It's important that in either case you pay attention to the list of elements required uh, on the previous slide and adhere to those page limits. Um, remember that you're also allowed to, to upload supporting documents and provide a video link. Uh, it's probably easier if you build an external document using the list of elements uh, required and and then you can when you're in the submission online submission tool you can click a button that says you know i'm going to answer these by uh by attachment and then you don't have to go through each of those questions you can also do both if you wish um, it's up to you okay and our final and frequently asked question what will be required of challenge phase winners to be able to compete for product phase awards? 
So challenge phase winners will be required to execute a non-disclosure agreement with Nine Sigma and submit a more detailed plan that explains tasks and timeline for how you plan to fo that you plan to follow in order to continue the development of your technology to enable deployment or commercialization. You should explain in that plan uh, what you plan to do, what kinds of deadlines and what kinds of deliverables uh, will occur. And then during the period from approximately October 2018 to July 2019, you will work against your plan. You're also going to need to explain how you're going to involve an Ohio in-state entity in your effort. So by, uh, by July 31st, 2019, you will submit another response as a report in which you discuss the progress made against your plan. And you are going to need to provide evidence that supports a path towards deployment. You should also be prepared to present a 30-minute progress report by web conference to the judging panel who will be selecting who receives the product phase award that for those four $1 million prizes. We'll provide further details about the requirements of this activity before the challenge phase deadline. Winners of the product phase award will be obligated to deliver periodic reports to Nine Sigma from about quarter four, 2019 through quarter four, 2021. We'll probably ask you to provide some data that may be disclosed to the state of Ohio. Uh, you'll also be able to provide data and, and um, comment that is, is considered uh, private or, or confidential at that point. We will provide further details about this activity uh, before the product phase starts. Great, thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, it's now time for our live Q&A. Uh, if you haven't already done so, uh, this would be an excellent opportunity for you to pose your questions uh, to our speakers for today's webinar. We'll take the rest of our time today to go through your questions. We already have a handful of them uh, ready and waiting. If, however, we don't get to your questions today, don't worry, the Q&A session as part of this webinar will be made available as part of the transcript uh, so you'll still have access to it. Uh, additionally, if you think of a question that you would like to ask uh, regarding this topic at, after today's webinar, uh, you can reach out to Nine Sigma to get the information that you're seeking. We'll be able to provide that email for you in just a little bit. Okay, our very first question. First, can a technology be geared towards addressing addiction within a specific excuse me, specific community, for example, seniors or veterans? So uh, I'll take that one, Jonathan. Um, the answer is yes, but remember that one of the evaluation criteria that you are um, being evaluated against is the impact, how many people you are likely to help. So it's important for you to explain um, how looking at a subset of all of the folks affected by the opioid crisis is still impactful. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, our next question, can Nine Sigma or the state of Ohio connect me with an in-state entity to partner with? Strictly speaking, the answer to that question is no. Um, it's, it's up to you to find uh, partners to, to work with. Um, depending on what your approach is, you know, that might entail seeking out uh, a treatment center or service within the state of Ohio, an academician from the state of Ohio, or some other entity. Um, we would encourage you to have a look at uh, things like the Society for Addiction Treatment Prevention, things like that. Okay, uh, our next question is uh, somewhat similar uh, in terms of the uh, partnership aspect. Uh, if my, excuse me, if my development plan requires assistance from another party that I've not yet identified, does that disqualify? So the answer to that is basically no. Um, as long as you meet the requirements for eligibility in the official rules for the challenge phase, that is, you be registered to do business in the state of Ohio, 
or you're an in-state en entity already, uh, or you're partnered with one, um, you'll be fine. If, if you do not have that partnership aligned before submitting, um, you will have the opportunity to add participants to your team to make that possible. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, our next question has just come in. Uh, are there specific services that would be of greater interest than others? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. I think it goes back to uh, what's the impact, what, what audience impact are you anticipating? And um, you'll need to consider that as you prepare your submission. Um, we're not going to limit this to any one approach. Uh, certainly, the idea that you offer a tool to help a, a recovering addict seek assistance when they're having a, a difficult period or an, uh, some device that, that someone in early stages of treatment could wear that might um, counteract an overdose if they should happen to to use again, um, you know, there could be a, a wide variety of approaches here. Um, we're not, we're not per se limiting that. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, our next question. Um, you mentioned that predictive analytics to influence policy is not of interest, but what if predictive analytics is used in another way? Would that still be of interest? So, if, if predictive analytics somehow helps you apply a technology to provide the, the requested function, that is to enable in immediate and extended access for relapse or overdose intervention, um, if that somehow helps you do that, then fine, that's, that's okay. Um, we're not saying not to use predictive analytics, we're just saying we're not looking for pro, uh, uh, approaches that inform public policy. That's just not of interest. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, we have uh, one more question coming in uh, right now. Um, what sort of supporting data would be considered as compelling? That's a good question. Um, you need some way of, of essentially proving that your approach is valuable um, and, and uh, David Gustafson sort of alluded to the idea that, you know, you probably need to develop some form of clinical trial, depending on what your approach actually entails. So if it's a medical device, then you have to obviously meet the regulatory requirements for FDA approval. And uh, those are fairly specific in, in how you go about, you know, establishing efficacy. Um, really, you need to be looking at that kind of um, requirement, you know, depending on what you're proposing. And, and if, let's say, you're, you're not proposing something that's strictly speaking a device or, or a drug, you still have to have some clear evidence that your, your technology is useful. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, for that answer. Uh, at the moment, we're experiencing a little bit of a lull in terms of questions coming in, so we'll wait just a moment to see if our attendees have any further questions. Uh, if there is no further questions, we'll proceed with the wrap-up of today's webinar. Um, as I said, if you've got questions for our, uh, our speakers today, now would be an excellent time to post them to them. Uh, but if you think of something afterwards, don't worry, we've got you covered uh, on the next slide. All right, it looks like we don't have any additional questions coming in, so I will go ahead and proceed to the wrap up. So, for those of you listening today, what can you do today? First and foremost, you can obviously visit the project page. The URL is listed right there on your screen. It's ninesites.ninesigma.com slash web slash topic three. That will take you to topic three, which is connect within the opioid technology challenge. Uh, while you're there, you can register to receive updates and to join the community. Obviously, that would be very, very important. Uh, if you need a specific assistance, uh, you have a question about the project, you have a question about how you go about submitting your response or what you can include in your response, 
please feel free to reach out to the Nine Sigma Solution Provider Help Desk. The email address that I mentioned earlier is phd at nine sigma.com. That email once again, phd at nine sigma.com. Uh, you want to reach us by phone, you can do so at area code 216-283-3901. Uh, lastly, very important, the submission deadline is July 11th, 2018 at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We strongly recommend that you submit your response in advance of that 5 p.m. deadline as we won't be able to accept any submissions after 5 p.m. Uh, so please make sure that you do so uh, well in advance. Uh, that is all we have for you today. Uh, to our speakers, David Gustafson and Kevin Andrews, uh, thank you gentlemen both for your time and your expertise in this matter. To our attendees, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you joining us today and listening to us. Uh, we look forward to seeing your response. Uh, to all of you, thank you very, very much. Have a great day.